I do think that there's this idea that if we were to go to Mars, if we were to try and colonize another planet, we would not be growing crops. We would use a system like this to synthesize the things that people want to eat from what the atmosphere is providing, from the gases that are all around us, using a renewable power source. We, we partner with a company called Friesland Campina. They're one of the largest dairy producers in the world. They're based out of the Netherlands. Um, they're a dairy producer. They are owned by a, by a dairy producer. They're, it's a dairy cooperative. And they want to make recombinant dairy proteins. So um, I think what we're seeing is that these big companies in the world are seeing that the technology is real. It's not BS. And the economics could play out. And if it does, they can't be left behind. I'm not sure that a startup with all of the challenges of being a startup and building all this tech and dealing with expensive people, et cetera, et cetera, not having the benefits of scale or the network of distribution is necessarily going to win. So I think that it may be the case that some of these technology players end up accruing much of the value of this transformation that's happening. And the ultimate end products get produced by and distributed by these big ingredients companies that are already in the market. And you know, they, they're happy to cannibalize themselves if the product is real and they can make money doing it. Hey everyone, in today's video, I want to go through an excellent interview by David Freeberg. It was just uploaded a couple days ago by Egg Funder. Highly recommend you check out the full interview, which is in the description, and check out Egg Funder because they produce a lot of great content for anyone who's interested in this space. So we're going to go through the interview, and I'm going to sprinkle a few of my own comments and analysis in the video. I'm specifically only looking at the part of the interview which covers plant-based meats and alternative proteins, precision fermentation, and cellular agriculture. Let's get into it. Alternative proteins, um, <clears throat> so great thesis coming out 10 years ago that you could show high titers, which is grams per liter of production in microorganisms to make animal proteins. And you could extrapolate and say at scale, at 500,000 liters plus, this makes economic sense. I can compete with the traditional protein. I can compete with egg and milk and cheese and all this stuff. And it turns out that as you try and do that scale up, there's a really, really hard industrial scale problem, right? Not every tank is filled 100%. Your capture rate of the protein out of the tank is slow. There's a lot of manual processes. The cost of the tank is really high because you've got to buy these super expensive stainless steel fermenters. The downstream processing causes yield loss, so you're, you're losing a bunch of it. So the net economics on making proteins using microorganisms, or what people are calling precision fermentation, isn't proving out at scale to be what everyone theorized it could or should be. Now, it is important to note that David Freeberg is probably taking the point of view of a venture capitalist. And so when you look at that fund, the seven-year timeline, maybe 10 years, it just hasn't panned out yet. But we're still early days. Like we've seen in one of the earlier videos on investing in cellular agriculture, these things take time, and they're quite difficult. And a lot of it isn't necessarily going to fit within a traditional venture capital funding timeline. Now... At the same time, the technology to evolve strains, to make them super high titer, super high yielding, is extraordinary. We're seeing titers we've never seen in fermentation before. So we're making an incredible amount of protein you know, per, uh, per liter, an incredible number of grams per liter. But you know, we have to convert that at the industrial scale downstream. So I think there's a lot of work going on right now on that industrial process. What I see happening in precision fermentation is what you see in most technology markets which is initially they start with this kind of vertical stack where someone tries to do everything. Strain engineering, process engineering, scale up, and do in manufacturing in-house. It turns out that manufacturing should maybe be done by the best manufacturer, uh, and sales, and product, and all, this, right, all the other stuff that goes to customers. Um, maybe the CPG businesses should be making the product. Um, maybe the strain engineering should be done by low-cost, ultra-high throughput strain engineering programs. Uh, maybe the scale-up of process engineering should be done by an expertise or a system that can do that really cheaply and effectively. So I think what we're seeing now is the emergence of horizontal technology players that are going to be the best at every one of those steps. And then they can service the needs of the whole industry and try to get a lot of these precision fermentation proteins to market quickly and cheaply and scalably so that they actually make sense and can compete and win. Remember the video earlier this fall where we talked about Perfect Day selling their consumer product company off? This might explain a lot of the reasoning behind that. In alternative proteins, like plant proteins, it's a consumer business. It's a hard one. Um, a lot of these plant protein businesses have a great up and then a great down. Um, and you know, we've seen this 
uh, in a, a kind of very public way with a couple of companies. Um, but it really is because you're trying to get consumers to pay a premium to feel good about their health, to feel good about the planet. That only lasts so long and it only scales so far. At the end of the day, if consumers aren't getting the same delicious protein that tastes the same and it's cheaper, at some point, most consumers will not end up buying that product. They'll go back to the thing that's tastier and cheaper and, and convenient. So I think that's the challenge of a lot of the plant protein products. And you saw, you know, even a year and a half, two years ago, like companies like Give It On were saying, I don't think we're actually, the demand curve that we had projected for plant proteins is collapsing. It's not what we thought it was gonna be. And all the CPG companies are saying, hey, you know, the purchase rate and the, the repurchase on this stuff isn't that good. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, unless we can have some breakthroughs in cost and taste, I think they're just um, what, what are otherwise known as kind of what I would call luxury brands where you feel good, you pay a premium, you feel good, you do good for the planet, good for yourself, but you know, it's not going to hit that 95% of the market that it really needs to to fix the animal protein problem that we have in our um, systems. I don't know about you, but I would rather be eating beans, tofu, healthy ingredients than eat a lot of these processed products like Beyond Burger or Impossible Meat. Uh, the third category is cellular meat. Um, cellular meat is at its very beginning days. Uh, when we first started doing cellular meat 15 years ago, we were trying to do it on these little microstructures because the way you know, tissue cells grow in, in muscle is they grow in, in structure, in 3D structure. So um, we've now kind of recognized that we need to grow them in suspension, in big tanks, in order for it to make economic sense. So the first challenge is how do you get cells that'll grow in suspension, meaning they're not attached to other cells, and then the second is how do you get them to grow quickly? And the third is how do you get them to grow quickly and not use the super expensive fetal bovine serum that everyone started out using? There was an executive at Merck that said privately, I think, um, uh, you know, we'll sell a billion dollars of fetal bovine serum over the next five years to all these startups trying to do cellular meat, and then we're going to sell zero because it makes no economic sense for people to spend this much on this product. So there's a lot of engineering going on, gene editing work going on to try and change how those cells grow and how they get fed. So you can change the feedstock in the tanks and hopefully get to a good economic outcome there. So um, I would say that we're in the first inning still on cellular meat, on figuring out which cell, you, you gotta get a cell line, you gotta get it to grow in suspension, you gotta get it to grow quickly, and you gotta get it to, to, to consume stuff and have um, you know, uh, a feedstock that it can sit in uh, that, that's not expensive. Do you think that in Celag it'll be similar, it'll play out similarly to precision fermentation where For you have the time. players yeah. coming in horizontally to provide those different yes. pieces? So I think what we're seeing now is um, companies that have really great starter lines, stem cell lines that they can use. Um, another set of companies that are doing uh, you know, uh, high throughput um, editing and screening. You know, we have one of those companies called Triple Bar Bio um, and we're you know, part, we've announced that we've partnered with a couple of different cellular meat companies to help them do that. Um, and then we're seeing companies that are also working on all those growth factors, so the media, and so trying to create recombinant versions of the media where they're making the proteins or engineering different proteins and different uh, materials that go into the feedstock. So um, you're seeing all these kind of like different technology mm -hmm. companies emerge that aren't just trying to make one product for consumers all the way from the lab through to the market, um, but where they're coming in and saying, I'm gonna make the lowest cost feedstock for all the cellular meat companies, or I'm gonna make um, you know, the best strain engineering program, uh, that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. But how appealing is that for investors? Because a lot of investors say that they want to have the company that has the CPG brand part to it to capture the margins, and how, how do you look at that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure that those companies are gonna win, um, and here's what I think is happening in the market. Tyson, Ingredion, um, Cargill, these companies all have a point of view. We, we partner with a company called Friesland Campina. They're one of the largest dairy producers in the world. They're based out of the Netherlands. Um, they're a dairy producer. They are owned by, a, by dairy producers. They're, it's a dairy cooperative. And they want to make recombinant dairy proteins. So um, I think what we're seeing is that these big companies in the world are seeing that the technology is real. It's not BS. And the economics could play out. And if it does, they can't be left behind. So they are the ones that are likely going to end up, in my opinion, being the large producers, distributors, manufacturers, and brands that are going to bring all these products to market. I'm not sure that a startup 
with all of the challenges of being a startup and building all this tech and dealing with expensive people, et cetera, et cetera, not having the benefits of scale or the network of distribution is necessarily going to win. So I think that it may be the case that some of these technology players end up accruing much of the value of this transformation that's happening, and the ultimate end products get produced by and distributed by these big ingredients companies that are already in the market, and you know, they, they're happy to cannibalize themselves if the product is real and they can make money doing it. In my opinion, companies like Perfect Day and every company, every company is a portfolio company of the production board, which is run by David Freeberg, so keep that in mind. But in my opinion, those would be some of the companies couple of examples of these technology providers. I love and appreciate and am myself one with idealistic ideals, okay? So <laughs> we all want to have a farm in our backyard like Michael Pollan promotes and we all want to make our own food, but it, it doesn't make sense when you have an apartment building with 40 floors and you got to feed everyone in that apartment building and so on. So, um, which, you know, is the majority of the urbanization, which is 60% of the population in the US and more in China. So, um, and it's happening in, in Africa too. Um, all technology starts out big, slow, expensive, and central. So think about a mainframe computer. It filled a room, it cost $15 million, it took forever to do something, and we would each be able to get the exact same thing out of it. Now we each have a supercomputer in our pocket. It's small, it's fast, it's cheap, it's more powerful, and it's personalized. I get my own version of stuff coming out of it. Um, I think you could say the same about media production, where it started with big studios, and now we're all YouTube creators, and we're all Instagram creators. Um, and you can see this across the you know, uh, books and publishing, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so much of, I think, technology ultimately kind of finds its way to the edge of the network. And I think we're seeing that in manufacturing, particularly in food manufacturing, because what happens is a lot of new technologies emerge that allow you to shrink, speed up, and distribute the technology. Um, so we're seeing that now. I think in the earlier days uh, in, uh, in the food system. So at the end of 2021, there was a paper published by a team in China uh, where they demonstrated a chemoenzymatic system for synthesizing starch. Starch is amylose and amylopectin, two molecules. And the structure of how amylose and amylopectin are put together creates the difference between all the different kinds of starches we know potato starch, rice flour, wheat flour, and so on. They're all the same two molecules, amylose and amylopectin. So this team identified seven enzymes from plants that basically catalyzed the transformation of sugars over to starch into amylose and amylopectin. And the first step is to capture carbon from the atmosphere. So it fixes carbon dioxide. And then it uses some chemical step to start the, the enzymatic steps that drive the starch production. Now, the efficiency of this system was nine times more efficient than corn, is what they demonstrated. So do we need all the land and all the resources and all the carbon and all the nitrogen and all the ammonia production that goes into growing all of these calories that we just talked about, the 80, 85% of the world's calories, which are mostly coming to us, 60 70% of them are coming to us in the form of those two molecules, amylose and amylopectin. Theoretically, if this system is demonstrated and scaled, we could make amylose and amylopectin locally, and then on the output have it be converted into all the different things we want to consume, like rice or pasta or potatoes or french fries or all these different variants of the end products of food that many people like to consume. Now, I'm not super advocating for a Soylent-type machine where you got these little you know, weird molecule printers all over, um, but I do think if you think about that, the nine times more efficient than corn model, you can start to see why some technologies like this would allow us maybe to take what so much of the food system does, which is to grow stuff in a distributed way, ship it, process it, then we process most of our food, and then we make lots of different food, and then we ship it out to the edge of the network. Super inefficient, a lot of calories lost, a lot of energy lost, a lot of water and carbon, et cetera. But these other technologies that are emerging will allow us to have systems more locally that don't necessarily even require growing stuff on the land. Now, the driver for that system will actually need to be hydrogen gas. So one thing that we do need is green hydrogen. So if we can generate green hydrogen, you know, um, which you can generate from seawater, if you had a renewable power source, theoretically, you could just print out starch all day long using atmospheric carbon. Now, we're in the pre-prototype phase right now. So it's theoretical. 
But I think it's another good proof point that it's not just proteins, which is what we talk a lot about in precision fermentation. But we're also now starting to see a couple of companies making fats using precision fermentation. And now, theoretically, we can also make starches. We can make carbohydrates, and we can make sugars. So I do think that there's this idea that if we were to go to Mars, if we were to try and colonize another planet, we would not be growing crops. We would use a system like this to synthesize the things that people want to eat from what the atmosphere is providing, from the gases that are all around us, using a renewable power source. So I think we've got to get those, those, uh, those energy costs down. You know, average energy prices in the US today are, call it 11 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Once you get in that one to three cents a kilowatt hour price range, that's when you really have these breakthrough economics on being able to drive some of these different systems and have them work from a cost perspective locally. But they are really energy hungry. So um, you need to get cheap renewable energy sources, and then you can use these more efficient technologies to make the stuff that we want to consume. So what I keep on hearing is that cheap energy is key to getting a lot of these technologies to work. Canada is doing one thing. The U.S. is doing another thing. I'm just going to leave you with this. The construction cost overruns for the pipeline that Ottawa bought are jaw-dropping. And Trans Mountain's plans to pass those costs on to oil companies who plan to ship their product on the line appear to be fading fast. But of course, Tesla's just a car company, so you can ignore all that. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.